Um, yeah. Thanks a lot for showing up. <coughs> Sorry, I'm, I have a slight cold, um, so I'm, I'm highly doped, but uh, yeah, please bear with me. Uh, I totally want to give this talk and I'm really happy that so many of you are coming for such a boring topic. Uh, documentation is boring, right? Yeah. No. no? Okay. Um, okay. You are always already one step ahead of me. So, quick survey: How many of you are involved in open source projects? Okay. Um, how many of you are open so involved in open source projects that don't have any documentation? <laughs> how many of you are trying to change that? <coughs> and how many of you have actually written documentation before? Whoa! Whoa! Didn't expect that. Okay, um, so this talk is titled Writing Open Source Documentation for Open Source Project. Um, it's based on our experiences at SUSE, but uh, we can apply the lessons that we have learned to other projects as well, and I will tell you uh, how to do so. First, uh, something about me. Um, my name is Christoph Wickert, as you have already heard. I'm a Linux user since 1999. In 2005, I became a contributor to various projects, such as the Fedora project, where I've been very active. If people know me, they probably know me from Fedora. Um, also, I've been involved with XFCE and LXDE and the One Laptop Per Child initiative. In 2010, I was hired by Colab Systems, the nice guys downstairs with the Colab Cooper server. And uh, yeah, early last year I joined SUSE as a uh, technical documentation writer. And as you can see here, I'm not sure if you can read it, this is the invoice from the first ever Linux distribution I bought, mm -hmm. uh, SUSE Linux 6.1 student version for 79 Deutschmarks in 1999. One of the reasons why I purchased SUSE was, well, everybody was using it at the time. If people were using uh, Linux, they were using, or in Germany in particular, they were using SUSE. And one of the reasons for that is it was a German distribution and it was always very strong when it comes to documentation. So documentation, this big handbook, uh, was a great benefit. I still use this even when I no longer use OpenSUSE. I've been using other distributions. I've been using Debian, Fedora, or whatnot. Uh, but still, documentation was the key. So that's me. Uh, who are we? That's the OpenSUSE documentation team at the Write the Doc co Docs conference in Prague uh, uh, in fall last year, I think. There you can see me down there. Yeah, in, in the back you can see our team lead, Markus Feiner, probably some of him know him from <laughs> Linux Magazine. And yeah, that's not even all of us, there's more, because uh, we have been growing rapidly. SUSE has been growing, the documentation team has been growing, and also the, numbers of the number of products that we are to document is also steadily increasing. So who are we? So the next question obviously is, what do we want? Mm -hmm. And we want to document all the things. Um, so much for the laughter, that's, that's the only picture. I suck at slides, uh, so the rest of this presentation will be boring. Um, yeah, what do, you, what do you mean with um, document all these things? Uh, here's, yeah, you probably cannot read it. I can't read it either. It's too small. Here you have an overview of the SUSE documentation website. Um, as you can see, it's quite a lot. Um, if you go, that's only by products. If you go further down into one of the products, you see uh, different kinds of guides like get it started or quick install guides, deployment guides, user guides, administrator guides, then certain topic oriented guides like tuning guides, virtualization guides, and of course with every new release we have release notes. Uh, all of that sums up to, I think at the moment it's 14,000 pages, if I'm not mistaken, with uh, SUSE Linux Enter Enterprise 12. So that's quite a lot of documentation. And the question becomes, how do we 
handle that? How do we write it and how do we handle it? So we are talking about the tool chain. SUSE has basically written a tool chain of its own because we figured at the time we started, I mean that predates me joining SUSE, but at the time they started uh, they couldn't find any decent tools. Um, if you go to, if, if some of you are in documentation and they go to special documentation conferences, not like Write the Docs, which is focusing on free software, but to like TECOM, the German uh, Foundation for Technical Documentation, you will see all of that is proprietary. And of course, SUSE uh, didn't want to go that way, so we did everything on our own, and we wrote a fully uh, open source um, tool chain. We start off with DocBook XML. Um, for us, it's the language of our choice. I know there are others. I know that, that actually uh, we are like the dinosaur. Everybody has moved on to something more modern like, uh, like just markup or um, yeah. Uh, there's, there's plenty of stuff, but at Write the Docs, I figured that we are one of the few to use DocBook. But on the other hand, I very much like the semantics. Um, well, there's, there's a lot of uh, advantages. Uh, too much to explain it now. Um, I could go on. But we, fi we really figured it was the only language that catered all our use cases. So, uh, whatever other language came up, there was always some feature missing. Um, <laughs> As it's DocBook, uh, as it's XML, it's, uh, as people say, write-only language. You can write it, but you cannot read it, right? Um, <coughs> the, the upside is many people are familiar with HTML or XML in general, and uh, many of them can, they, you can learn it pretty quickly if you just do a short, if you want to submit a short patch or something like that. Uh, you can, if you see para, para, okay, that probably means paragraph. I should put my text into, inside a paragraph and you're done. So that's pretty, pretty trivial. Um, and you can see all about DocBook um, um, at docbook.org. Next, uh, when you have the language, you need an editor. Um, you know, probably know this from uh, classical programmer paintings on Tumblr. That is the everlasting battle of uh, Emacs versus Vim. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yes, you can use any editor you want. I'm favoring Vim. Most of the others in the team are using Emacs. There are proprietary editors. Um, there are you, you can use Gedit, uh, Jedit, uh, whatever. Uh, Atomic, uh, no, it, Atom. Yeah, Atom. Uh, so many of them. Um, once you've created your code in, or your docbook files in um, the editor, you need to somehow publish it. And this is where our tool chain kicks in. We wrote a tool that is called DAPS, the docbook, docbook authoring and publishing suite. Um, this is on GitHub. It's open source, you can use it. So. Um, some people say, well, what is DAPS? It's basically uh, a wrapper around uh, Make. And I hear some of you complaining, oh, are you really talking about GNU Make? I hate GNU Make. No, actually, GNU Make is the, I mean, it's the dependency-based build tool, and that's exactly what you need if you want to generate output files. When people say they don't like uh, Make, it turns out they most of the time they are using they are talking about auto make so they are in fact referring to the auto tools which I don't like either but anyway GNU make is the tool of our choice it's running in the background and uh, you have one uh, front end which you can use to um, do all kinds of um, commands the simplest thing is DAPS validate you want to know if your output is valid uh, if you want to generate a PDF file, you just type dubs PDF. You can see that make is running in the back because the that's actually like the targets for make, PDF, HTML. Then you can also pass options like grayscale, uh, PDF, or HTML single. Otherwise, you get a chunk of files. Uh, we have lots of formats. You can generate MAN pages, plain text files. Plain text files are not that easy. Uh, we are using uh, we, We3M, the browser, when it comes to uh, tables. 
you want to have a clear output. So that's why we first render it into HTML, then use the browser to display it and save it to a text file. Uh, you can do EPUB with Calibre, and from that you can also generate Mobi files for your Kindle, and you can generate the Web Help. That's a special format of HTML. Uh, it comes with a, a with a table of contents at the side and with a search bar that is using some JavaScript. Uh, so if you are using for something standalone for your product and uh, you only want this one single help piece on the internet, you probably go for web help. <coughs> but you can not only generate output formats, you can also do lots of interesting stuff with it. Um, okay, here I need to explain something. There's a call, uh, the minus D parameter um, refers to the configuration file. Every document has a configuration file where you specify the document root, the starting point, every XML um, <laughs> element has an XML ID, so you start, uh, say from here on I start. <coughs> so you give it the configuration file and then you can say uh, list files, um, I'm looking for the, in, I, I have a ton of files in my repository and I'm looking for the file that contains the root ID art for article dubs quick and I can get that without, I mean I could get that with grep probably but that would also list a lot of false positives so we have a command for that or you can s give a, uh, say generate me a list of all images uh, with the modification date and also show these uh, images in a viewer so it's quite a comprehensive tool. Then we have some SUSE specific commands. Um, dubs lock drop. So the translation we do, we are, uh, it's written in English, even though most of our team is German, which sometimes you can uh, really see it was written by Germans, um, because Germans have a special way of uh, writing or speaking English especially when it comes to the to the words like have to must need they are used differently in german and yeah so we write in english and it's then uh, gener uh, translated by a translation agency by an external uh, translation agency that's focused on uh, technical documentation um, in order to have them translate our software uh, we give them basically a big tarball in a in a clearly defined format with all the images and so on. So that's generated with lock drop and after the translated uh, documents come back we can do unpack lock drop or we can just do the uh, online target, dubs online, to generate uh, online doc to generate the online documentation that you see on the SUSE website. So that's actually a quite powerful tool. We are still improving it and we are meanwhile not the only ones uh, that are using it. A while back we received our first patch by somebody from Salando. You probably know them so they are obviously using it too. Um, next in the uh, tool chain we have the style sheets. Um, you have the XML and you need a style sheet to generate the different output formats. For example we have standalone books or bigger like the manuals, the guides, we have single articles which are just a few pages, we have just, just the HTML and we have different, I mean it's the difference if you have a PDF or if you have a website. For example on the, in the PDF file you want um, URLs in links to be written out because on paper you cannot click, I mean you need to uh, have them written out. So this is done with the uh, XSLT style sheets. Um, yeah, the next we have a style guide that reminds us uh, how to phrase. It's, it's not only about phrasing, it's, uh, well, how to spell certain terms, recurring terms, uh, what tone to use, how do you address the reader, what's the target audience and all of that. So you want to have a consistent voice throughout all your document. You want to have consistent namings, uh, consistent use of terms. And all that, and also the structure and markup needs to be consistently, all that's in our style guide. Um, we then have a style checker, which is a tool that you can manually run on um, the, uh, on an XML file. It will output a f an HTML file, which you can then view in the browser. 
and if you view it in the browser um, you get this nice these are actually little plus signs where you can just fold the, the paragraphs um, and then you get a list of, of uh, well, notes and warnings uh, of things you should probably fix. <coughs> so much for the style checker. We have yet more tools. All of them are on GitHub in the OpenSUSE organization. Um, Dubs Env is something that we just uh, finished recently, or it's, well, it's not finished, but we uh, brought it into production uh, this week. It's continuous integration with Docker. We have DBX Includer uh, for, um, well, in any of you knows DocBook, you can have includes, but you have the problem that if you have XML IDs, they need to be unique. And if you use an uh, include various time in the doc document, the, the IDs are no longer uh, unique. That's something that we solve with DBX Includer. We have the doc manager um, that manages meta tags. Um, for example, is this document going to be translated or not? That's something, or what path is, uh, once it pu it's published on the website, what's the URL? These are custom tags that we added and we, they are managed through the doc manager. We have a doc stats tool. Um, GeekoDoc is our um, doc book uh, subset. We don't use the full set of doc book because it's just way too big. We want to actually limit uh, the documentation writer to a certain subset of elements that they can use. And also that, that allows you to enforce guidelines like you must not use uh, nested lists with X level of nesting or you must not use uh, uh, this element inside the other element. And all that's uh, in the Geeko doc. Of course, you need an editor that can read the uh, schema files. And that, uh, I mean, that not only does syntax, like uh, syntax highlighting or autocomplete, but that also like the, the structure or the, the semantic syntax thing. Um, and also XML, diff, and G. Um, Next ng is next generation. There was already an XML diff out there. Um, if you compare XML files uh, the classical way as you do with Git, for example, I mean, even though we try to have very strict uh, with with uh, did I mention DUPS auto format uh, uh, earlier? So we have common formatting like like indentions and and no white spaces at the end of the line and all that. Even though sometimes patches look messy, uh, and that's why you can use duck, duck, uh, the XML diff ng to really compare the content of um, the files, not the XML syntax. Okay, so much for the tool chain. Uh, you can ask questions later. Now I'm going to talk about the process. As I say, it's all open. Um, everything is on GitHub. Here you see the Docsly repository, so that's the, it's no longer the OpenSUSE organization, it's the SUSE organization on GitHub. You have Docsly and other uh, repositories all prefixed with doc, that's us. Uh, SLI is uh, SUSE Linux Enterprise Server and related products. Here you can see the DC files for the admin guide or for the everything guide and so on. Um, yeah, it's on GitHub. Uh, you can submit pull requests. You can you can take it uh, as you need it. And from the Slay documentation, we also built the OpenSUSE documentation. It's basically the same thing, except that phrases like SUSE Linux Enterprise are replaced with... Uh, oh, the time is actually getting longer? Sorry, I have the wrong slide for you. Oh, I was hurrying up, and, and now I, I I have 30 minutes left. Okay, I, I <laughs> slow down a bit. Thanks. Um, <coughs> Yeah, it's on GitHub, you can use it, you can fork it, you can do whatever you want with it. Uh, you can even, some people even, uh, we were surprised uh, a while ago when we saw our documentation on Amazon. Somebody is obviously uh, generating books from it, printing it and selling it. We have no idea who it is, we have nothing to do with it, but it's our documentation. It's, it's really ours, we ver uh, verified it. So you can do that, it's open, it's all uh, GFDL licensed. Uh, use it as you like. 
So when we are talking about Git, I need to explain the branching model a bit. Uh, maybe some of you have read this article, the successful Git branching model by Vincent Driesen. Uh, well, it, the um, schema, it's not, the diagram is not necessarily the most, uh, uh, it looks a bit messy, but it's, beca but it's because it's so small. So basically we are using the develop branch for development. Uh, the master branch is the blue one over here. It's only used for releases. Uh, there you have the text for every release. And then we have different branches for features, bug fixes, and maintenance. Um, and they all, they all follow a consistent naming, like uh, feature slash fade, one, two, three, four. Fade is the feature and enhancement tracker that SUSE is using. Uh, it's also open source. You can find it as open fade. It's also used in OpenSUSE for suggesting new features and uh, uh, discussing feature implementation. Uh, or bug fix, BSC is bugzilla.suse.com uh, and then the bug number. So we are trying to have a very consistent branch naming. Uh, people work on their own branches um, and when they are done with it, they submit a merge request uh, through GitHub and we are using, we recently started using the new review feature from uh, GitHub. Maybe I can show it later if people don't know it yet. Uh, that's actually something very nice. Yeah, and we are using this tool called Git Flow. Um, well, oh, there's a typo. It's uh, it's not F, but it's V. Uh, Git Flow A V H. That's a fork from the original Git Flow tool. So Git Flow is an extension. Or if you have a Git repository, you type Git Flow in it in it once. Uh, it adds some values to the configuration file that you can, uh, for example, the naming of these branches, the prefix, feature, bug fix, maintenance. Uh, yeah, it's a helper to implement this branching model and you can modify the configuration as you like, uh, <coughs> but it makes sure that you have consistent uh, naming. Uh, when you want to open a new uh, feature or you start working on something, you type git flow feature BSC1234 start. When you're done, you would use git flow feature finish, but we no longer use this, but uh, use uh, GitHub's reviews, uh, merges instead. Yeah, at GitHub things get reviewed, uh, thing, and then we, s we try to squash, uh, squash all the commits into one so that and, and then have a meaningful commit message that you can later cherry pick the whole feature or the whole bug fix without having to cherry pick 20 individual fixes, but one, one uh, commit only. Yeah, so much for the branching model. model. <coughs> now, uh, the bigger <laughs> picture. Um, so we have three main um, sources for input, either through Fade, which I already mentioned, uh, through Bugzilla, Partners or uh, employees file bugs uh, because they found, found a bug in the documentation or through a system that is called doc comments. I'll get to that later. After that, we do evaluation and planning. Uh, to be honest, uh, that's why I don't write it out there. We are using Trello for the organization. Uh, a lot of you are probably using it. Uh, personally, I don't like it. I don't like it because it's not open source, obviously. Uh, we are, or I'm trying to push people to use Fabricator instead or something else. Uh, but yeah, there's plenty of tools. I mean, c you can use, when it comes to tracking, there's, uh, there's so many open source tools out there. Uh, but nowadays, I mean, I'm old school. I use Bugzilla or something like that. Or at, at in Fedora, we use Bugzilla a lot. But uh, nowadays, people want to have these work boards and they want to have nice drag and drop in the browser and whatnot. So we use Trello. Um, that's important when it comes to planning. Uh, we assign resources. We have, we have this team of like 13 and we have these tasks to do and we have an estimation of how much every task uh, is. So you pick your Trello cards. This is what I'm working on. <coughs> yeah, that's really... So the resource planning is actually something I forgot here. Um, 
we have Gantt charts as well, but I don't do them and I don't know what the software uh, is called for doing it. Yeah, after the planning comes the uh, research. Uh, usually when there's something new you need to research it first. You cannot just uh, start documenting it straight away. Um, I mean, if I knew everything I wouldn't be, uh, yeah, I, I, well, there's nobody who knows everything. Actually, we do have some documentation writers who know more about certain things. Uh, they are focused of, on storage, for example, and they know they have so much, they have accumulated so much knowledge over the time. Um, but uh, usually, when there's something new, you first sit down with the developer for like two hours, and he he explains this new feature. Yeah. Then comes the documentation. This is where all the the uh, unicorns are born and and everything. Um, yeah, it's it's sometimes it's hard work, but it's just writing the the stuff. And I think I've explained the tool chain already. So let's just say it's magic. After that, we send it to the developers for feedback. It's not yet published. Uh, some of the documents are then translated, and then they are published on the website later. So. One thing, but that's actually, we are not done once it's published. I mean, it's it's a constant iteration, not only with every new SUSE release, but with every release of the documentation. Sometimes we do publish doc updates after the release, and also uh, with every feedback we get. And the feedback is something that many people uh, forget when they write documentation. So we have uh, two main methods for feedback. One is you can report a bug. Um, so as you can see these are two screenshots from the SUSE documentation, from the online documentation and there's actually a report bug at the bottom, uh, at the top for every paragraph which automatically opens Bugzilla, it fills in all the forms, uh, which book is it, which chapter, which everything and then people just need to fill out their feedback or their uh, criticism or whatever they have in the comment field of Bugzilla. Uh, the other system, I quickly briefly mentioned it earlier, it's called Doc Comments. Um, this is the system that you see here. Um, once again, in the background, we have the XSLT style sheets um, working. Uh, the XSLT style sheets, again, DocBook, they allow you to, um, for example, on the we have the we have a nightly version of the um, documentation that's generated every night. Uh, if you click the bug, uh, the feedback, bug, uh, feedback button there, you are directed to Bugzilla. But on the uh, documentation that is that goes live, you're directed to the doc comment system, which is uh, yeah more intuitive. You just need to fill out your email and your name and can provide feedback. So for technical people, Bugzilla is probably the way to submit feedback. For less tech-savvy people, it's probably documents. Or other people just send us uh, emails to doc-team at suze.com, so that works as well. But really, uh, don't forget the feedback. Uh, and don't rely on, on people. I mean, make it easy for people to give feedback. Don't re rely on, uh, if the hurdle is so hard, high that re you require them to submit uh, pull requests on GitHub, you probably won't get a lot of feedback. So there needs to be a low entry barrier for feedback. Um, and the more feedback you have, the easier it is, the more feedback you get, the more feedback you get, the better your documentation gets. And in the end, uh, ideally, all questions are answered and uh, yeah, no more feedback needed, which never happens. But all right, but so far that works out pretty well and I think compared to other uh, documentation teams we are doing pretty fine. Uh, we have seen that at uh, the Write the Doc uh, conference last year where people were telling us what they are planning to do and uh, we figured like oh we are already doing that, we are already doing this. So, on. But of course we do have some problems as well. Well, continuous integration, that problem was just solved uh, last week. Uh, but the biggest problem that I see is we are still doing the traditional waterfall thing. Um, we have tried to become more agile 
um, or, or more co continuous, um, but that doesn't necessarily work. Um, there's always a very short time frame between when a feature becomes ready for testing and for documenting um, and bef between the release. So after the, the beta, from beta to release, of uh, SUSE or open SUSE product. We are very, very, very busy and, and don't have time for anything else. Um, sometimes we even have to veto features. We can do that. Uh, if, the doc if there's no documentation and a feature is useless, uh, it probably gets delayed or we need to provide a documentation update later. So again, the, the workload throughout the year is not constant and uh, yeah, that's definitely something that we need to address. Uh, we are, but it's always a question of, I mean, of course you can do the whole agile thing and document every single feature and every line of code that the developer does, but then, I'll get to that in just a moment, uh, but then, uh, yeah, while you're in this, in this never-ending loop, um, you document something uh, if you have a scrum cycle, uh, a sprint, and after two weeks you figure out, oh, our developers went into the wrong direction, and let's do it from scratch, you have documented something, well, that isn't there, or you have documented it for, yeah, no, it doesn't work out, so you start all over again. Um, for example, screenshots are a typical example. Right before the release, we have to go through all the screenshots in the in the documentation again to make sure they are up to date. Even if only a tiny thing in the in the interface has changed, you definitely want the latest screenshot. Oh, the checkbox, or developers keep renaming uh, options or, or something like that, and you are referring to this option not only in the screenshot but in the text. So. This can become very cumbersome, and uh, if you do this last minute, um, yeah. Also, we are decoupled from development. That's both a bug, or can we just address your question later after the? Okay, okay I already addressed it. Thank you. Um, we are decoupled from development. Uh, that's both both a feature and a bug. Um, well, people think. A developer is the best person to write documentation, but he actually isn't. I mean, he knows the inner workings of his uh, application, but he doesn't know the user's expectations. For him, everything is so obvious. Why would people even ask questions, right? Um, so you always need, or in a perfect world, if, if your organization is big enough, you do have a dedicated documentation team or, or in your community you have some volunteers who do the documentation and ideally they are not the same ones uh, that are also working on the code. Uh, we inside SUSE can bridge this gap by sitting down with the developers, but on the other hand sometimes it's, uh, I mean sitting down is always uh, very nice, but sometimes it's also uh, emails back and forth, back and forth 20 times, that is cumbersome as well. Uh, so the coordination effort is very big. And um, the last problem that I see is, so the first two problems can probably be addressed with a more continuous and agile approach. We do have, for example, the cloud guys in, the, uh, in SUSE are working with the agile approach. They have a dedicated documentation writer in their team who works with the developers every day, uh, who follows their sprints. Um, so we will probably switch to, to a model like that, but on the other hand you still need, we have this big, big, big monolithic, as I s call it, uh, documentation like the reference guide or something. That's not something that you write on the drive-by while you're developing. That's a huge effort, and that's where you need the, the team of documentation writers. So we will try something in, the, in, in between, between an agile and a waterfall approach. Let's see where we end up with this. And uh, to address this monolithic issue, uh, the issue of, of, of this big monolithic thing, we will top probably switch to uh, more topic-oriented documentation. Topic-oriented is the new buzzword when it comes to documentation. That's like you have a single task, you have a user story, you want to go from A to B, want to achieve this or that. Um, yeah, that should be, that should lower or should solve some of the problems, but on the other hand, the traditional documentation, the 
admin guide or the reference guide is not going away anytime soon because people, customers want it. They want to have one point of contact where they have like all the options of this program or so. So um, the new topic oriented uh, formats we are using are more like an addition. We recently started a series called Sue's Best Practices which will do yeah the best practices for virtualization, the best practices for uh, this or that purpose, so that's more topic oriented. <coughs> and now let's go to the lessons we've learned. Docs or it didn't happen. I mean, you all know pics or it didn't happen. For us, it's docs or it didn't happen. If there's no documentation for your for your app, for I mean, even if it's just a tiny app, I had an app on my mobile. I had a problem with it. It turned out to be a bug. There was a button missing on a certain screen, but how was I supposed to know? There was no documentation. There was no reference des design. Should there be a button or not? So you totally need documentation. Even if some Mac guys tell you that programs should be so intuitive that they don't require documentation, you will need documentation, period. And don't consider your work done until, unless you're done with the documentation. A feature is not implemented if there's no documentation for it. Really, that's, that's things that, that also product managers need to understand. Of course, they want everything and they want everything now or they want everything last week. But if there's no QA and if there's no documentation, then it's not done, period. Yeah, as I already mentioned, developers should not write docs. Uh, we are doing it for a good reason. Um, don't write about the stuff you know by heart. Done? <laughs> Sorry, not. You know, somebody's taking, uh, taking photos of these slides. Um, yeah, you need feedback channels. Without feedback, it's all useless. You're running in circles. You have no idea what the user's expectations are actually are. Um, you, can do the, you can do the long reference guide. Uh, maybe it doesn't help. Maybe your users un uh, expect something completely different. So if you don't have feedback channels, um, yeah, then it's, it's not really worth the effort. So think about the feedback before you start writing and try to make the feedback as easy as possible. Um, yeah, you need tools. Don't try to spend too much time on tooling. I mean, we didn't write all these tools because we felt, oh, we need to write yet another tool. When we started out there, they were just not there. Meanwhile, there, there are other tools. For example, Fedora has at least has had a publi publican which is something similar to DAPS, but is meanwhile uh, orphaned, I think. It's no, uh, no longer used. Uh, Fedora recently switched away from uh, DocBook. Um, th there's, for example, Pandoc. That's something similar to what, uh, what we do with DAPS uh, that can translate between different documentation format and output PDF or HTML and so on. So there are already plenty of tools out there. Uh, if you have any question about a tool, or so you can ask me. Uh, but make sure you have the right tools for, for the job, to, to get the job done. Uh, yeah, don't spend too much time on tooling, but on the other hand, don't try to, uh, no, don't, you have to spend some time on the tooling, otherwise, otherwise the writing becomes too cumbersome, on, but on the other hand, don't reinvent the wheel by, by writing yet another, oh, this is solving our, all our documentation problems. There are some proprietary solutions out there which are really awesome, but totally useless. Well, for our use case, for our use case, useless. Um, uh, DITA or something like this, I mean, there's company making big money with it, but uh, it, it doesn't cater our use case. And when we them, I mean, we had sales agents uh, who were trying to convince us, and we tell them we've written our own, and uh, we publish it for free. They were like, what? OK, start small. Don't start with a reference guide. I mean, that's basically at the very top of the, uh, of the documentation. You start small. Start with a certain use case. Uh, try, I mean, at the very beginning, you probably don't have a community of documentation writers or, or your company doesn't have anyone employed uh, for writing documentation. So at the beginning, at least at the beginning, it will probably be the developer. 
try to see something from the user's perspective and try to try to think of the typical user tasks that a user uh, that the user is trying to achieve and and this particular topic write it down like how do i connect to the mail server or something like that but don't do the I'm covering all menu options of my program and, and, and all command line options or something like that. That's at the very, very end of the documentation. If, if you're done with everything else, you can do this. And last but not least, documentation should be open. If you're doing open source, uh, your documentation should be open. And by open, I not only mean um, have your sources somewhere on GitHub. I mean, we, we do have our sources on GitHub. You can do that, whatever you want, as I told you before. But uh, also try to have an open process that allows the community and allows uh, other people to, to give feedback, to participate. Um, yeah. Personally, we found it, uh, it's difficult to encourage the community to, to start working on documentation. Documentation is something that many people take for granted and you only use it when you have a problem. As long as everything is fine, you don't need it. So that's why probably not a lot of people want to work on it. But um, in, within the community, you can do something. I mean, start with something small like a wiki. Yeah, be open. And uh, that's the message I wanted to bring to all of you. If there are any questions, we have like eight minutes left or something. Yeah. Okay. First question. Uh, how do you manage the localization of your organization? Do you use some tools or? <coughs> so the question was, how do we manage the localization of our uh, documentation? Uh, I mentioned the doc manager earlier. Uh, the doc manager has so at the head of the document you have some some meta text, some, some additional um, doc book elements, uh, custom elements, and they define whether or not this documentation is translated. So for example, the install guide is translated into these 20 languages, the quick install, while the reference guide is only available in English, or the tuning guide, or the virtualization guide. So I think we have like around 20, 20 um, different um, languages. It's like well, we have like some stuff is not translated at all. Others is translated into six languages. And and if it, when you do the full languages, that's around 20. And that's all defined by these meta tags within the doc manager. We then give it to the translation agency, and from there they they go on uh, to to do the actual translations. <coughs> How they manage it? Because for me, uh, on the documentation I work, it's the transition, the, the worst <coughs> part, it's the, not the, it's the worst to maintain, to maintain the... Um, to be honest, so the question was, how do they do the actual management? Uh, to be honest, I don't know, because I don't do the translation myself. That's something that we have outsourced. Um, you can do this, for example, this is what we did at, Colab, uh, at the Colab Groupware server, uh, with tools like Transifex this online translation tool. Um, this is also good because it gives people small chunks. I mean, it's broken down to strings or to paragraphs and people can start working on it. So that's something that I would suggest. But uh, yeah, I can imagine that if you say, I have this file in English and I, now I'm doing it in, in German or something, that is, is difficult. But Sorry, I cannot really give you the answer. I don't know what their the translator's workflow is. I don't think they start from scratch, that, but they will probably really take our files and overwrite the text. But that's just a wild guess. And if you're looking for something for a community, I would recommend uh, tools like Transifex. Uh, so you say you don't like Trello because it's closed source, but you're publishing all of your work on GitHub. What do you think of the current state? Oh. Uh, available on services like GitHub, and would you be tempted to try and share some of your learning? Uh, so the que the question was, uh, if I may make it short, why we are using GitHub if it's uh, if it's closed source? Uh, well, on GitHub you have the large user base. Personally, I would like to use uh, GitLab or something. Yeah. Uh, well, so that's not actually my question. My question is, 
what do you think of the state of tools for documentation on services like GitHub and GitLab, and would you be willing to share some of your experience to improve those tools? Um, I don't think that integration of documentation, uh, I mean, they are focusing on code, not on documentation. Yep. Uh, for example, they can, if you're using markup, that works. Markup can be uh, displayed directly in line in uh, GitHub. Uh, of course, it's, well, the output depends on the browser or so, but you get an idea. If you look at an XML file in GitHub, it's just XML. I would love uh, GitHub to have an XML preview, but that's obviously not, not trivial because then th it needs to know the style sheets and, and whatnot. So, yeah, but really they don't care about uh, uh, documentation much, they care about code, but the uh, answer to this is treat documentation like you treat code. Apply continuous integration, apply release engineering tactics that you would use for code as well. But certainly the tools could be, or the services could be improved. You had a question as well? Yeah, I have a question. How do you guarantee at any moment in time that the documentation is reflecting the current state of suits? Um, we cannot. So the question was, how do we uh, guarantee that the documentation is up to date? And I'm sorry, I hate to admit it, we can't. Of course, we go through it, like when, when it comes to, say, the screenshots. That's a pretty trivial thing. You go over the documentation and make sure the screenshots are still up to date. But uh, we don't really rework every guide for every release. We implement the new features, we implement changes, but of course there sometimes is outdated uh, information still in there. That's where we rely on feedback, where we rely on users to file bugs. Uh, well, in a perfect world you would have quality assurance not only for code but also for documentation, that somebody really goes through it and makes sure it's still up to date, but uh, that's something that you cannot uh, really do because of the effort. Two quick questions. Uh, what is the longest time you have seen documentation to be in sync with the code? And the second one, what about technical writers? Uh, the second one is a very broad question, but... Yes, uh, let's specify. Why not employ technical writers to be kind of QA for the documentation? Okay, um, second question first. Uh, why not have technical writers as uh, QA uh, for documentation? Uh, I'm not saying that I'm against it, uh, but it's, it's the question whether or not if, if you can afford it, if you have somebody only working on, on QA of docs. Uh, and also I think that People who do QA, I've been doing QA before, they should be, see things just like the documentation writer needs to see things from a different perspective as the developer. Somebody in QA needs to see it from a different perspective. So actually maybe it, uh, a, docu a technical documentation writer wouldn't be the best per uh, uh, person for QA on docs. I would rather have uh, real world user testing of docs. Uh, have uh, grab people from the street and and tell them to perform this or that. If you have topic oriented uh, um, documentation, it should be easy to give people tasks that they fulfill, and then you see if it really works or not. That's more interesting than QA. So I think we are running out of time for questions. Okay, final questions uh, for those of you who don't have a chance. I will be around on the hallway. Uh, you can grab me there. Okay, you got the one question. Do you um, reach out for upstream? Sure, sure. Um, we reach out for up. So the question was if we reach out for upstream. Yes, we try to, um, but sometimes it's. It, I mean, if I find something that's we work with upstream. Um, but sometimes getting stuff back into upstream is very difficult. Like I recently had something that I needed to document which was some weird behavior of the Linux kernel when it comes to APIC routing. And so the only documentation out there was a five, a five lines of uh, text in a plain text file in the kernel source tree and uh, some comments in the kernel. 
code itself. I would love to fix that because then I can say, oh, I have a commit in the Linux kernel. Uh, but uh, as you can imagine, the process of getting something accepted uh, is quite cumbersome and at this point in time I'm not doing it. No. But other, we usually try to upstream everything, all of our work. And SUSE is actually contributing upstream, like we, we are doing the OpenStack <laughs> documentation for upstream open, OpenStack. Yeah. All right, um, I think that's all. Thanks very much for your... <laughs> yeah, so uh, use our tools, break them, uh, provide feedback, send fetches. Thanks a lot.